So welcome all. Thank you so much for hosting me this evening. It helps uh, be integrated within your academic community. I'm so excited to be with you. My name is Adelaide Dumb. I work at the Winuki National Resources Conservation District. We serve a very large geographic area, 42 towns along the Winuki River, um, doing technical service and assistance to, you know, anybody throughout the watershed in terms of agriculture, land management, um, all things conservation, we have a really nice. I um, have been the conservation specialist at the Winuki Natural Resources Conservation District. I've recently been promoted to the district manager, so I'm excited to serve the district and make it happy. It feels really good. Um, and I'm excited to be with you this evening to talk to you about one of our, uh, in my opinion, one of our most successful partnerships. Um, it's all about storytelling. Oh, and what's working? Oh, there we go. Okay. So, uh, the Storm Smart program, it has its infancy uh, right here in the valley. It started with um, Friends of the Mad River and sort of as a spin off of their Ridge to River program. Um, you know, it progressed and we partnered with them. And we also have Friends of the Goosey River. In our partnership with so Friends of the Mad, Friends of the UAC, and WNRTD, we culminated together to provide education and outreach on stormwater infrastructure for our community. Um, it's a free. There we go. <laughs> We're it's a free home site assessment, so essentially, um, the friends of the UT staff, friends of the Mad River staff, and WNITD staff are trained to come to your home, um, walk around your property, put the land in there. We look at a few different site parameters. We'll look at the main house. We look at the yard. If there's any red area, uh, we uh, look at each of those three uh, distinguished spots in the property, and then we really just the conversation style. Um, assessment, we provide insight and technical assistance to help landowners implement green storm. So, um, really, the reason why we're doing this to have you know that component within our watershed, you know, in terms of getting landowners involved in where they hold their files in the watershed, um, what that means in terms of overall watershed health. And how each landowner can feel empowered to make a difference. Um, we really like it kind of the big ripple effect. So, you know, we go and we talk with one property owner, and then they tell their neighbor, and then that person tells a friend, and you can sort of see it cascading out through the larger communities. We think that is really where the success is held. Um, as I mentioned, it's free. We come to your home and we identify areas where there's erosion, runoff, stormwater runoff, um, you know, just any area that looks like they could use some better management practices. And then we prioritize them to the land and we can get a lot of information to take in. And not everybody training in this incredible work. You know that many of you have your expertise in design work and engineering work and build. Um, but for the average person, can be uh, seen to So really, the idea for us is to come assess the property and help break down these barriers. I would like to pass around one of these, but I'll wait till the end. It's a really helpful tool the guide to stormwater management for homeowners and small business owners. It's a really great option guide. It really kind of emphasizes the do it yourself for a project. Um, and then for some of the larger infrastructure projects, again, we recommend different landscaping architecture companies um, to help implement some of these. Okay, so as I mentioned, uh, it started with Friends of the Mad River. Then we got another grant from the Lake Champlain Basin Program to expand 
this project um, within the Mississippi River watershed. And now we are on the second round of the Lake Champlain Peace Basin grant funding uh, for this work. And it's been extended to our entire service area within the district. So you can see it's a large geographic extent, covers the lake, um, goes all the way to the headwaters of the Mississippi River, dips a little bit into the Lamoille County and we're excited to have success, you know, in our partnership with this and then be able to expand it. So uh, this map is something that we put together in terms of one of our grant proposals for LCBT. You can see that uh, it highlights the parcels of residential land that are owned within our service area. Each of these little red parcels denotes uh, residential properties. So you might think, you know, there's some larger swaths of land that are foreign or that are state park land. But uh, if we really cater to the individual landowners and we see that projected ripple effect, we can have a great impact. Um, we haven't targeted every single person <laughs> within our service area, but the program has become really well marked in a lot of traction over the years. And it's really evolved, which is something that I'd like to talk to you about at the end of this presentation. But I think the evolution is one of the uh, main drivers of our success. You know, continuing to adapt what we've learned, what works well in terms of outreach, education, what uh, the individual landowners are receptive to, you know, um, et cetera. So I think it's just important to know um, the service area that we provide this assessment to. And then also uh, highlighting just how much land is in this I think it's all. I'm just going to put it down. So, in terms of outreach efforts, and this might help you in your work if you are interested in doing grant projects and, or you just want to get the word out about um, you know, something that you're invested in working on, if you need volunteers, for example. From Ports Forum, it's great. <laughs> I uh, moved on to Rhode from Pennsylvania originally. I lived in Southeast Wales in Washington, Colorado, before settling here in Vermont. I was sort of enamored of Earth Force Forum whenever I first moved here. It's really great. It's a great way to connect with your neighbors. It's also a great way to get the word out about exceptional programs that you're offering. So, from Earth Forum, um, Friends of the Magic River, Friends of the Lucy River, and WNRCD. Uh, all diligently posted. We saw a lot of responses from Porch, from Porch Forum. It also, you know, builds that neighborhood collective around, I'm doing a on infrastructure at my property. It's only going to go so far unless other neighbors go in and have this um, impact or reduction in terms of stormwater runoff and its impact on the watershed. So, from Porch Forum is great. Um, as you can see, word of mouth, newsletters, um, the Valley Reporters actually was pretty popular, and then uh, just having our partners and board members. So a lot of it, you know, we've, we've distilled it down into different categories of outreach, but a lot of it is word of mouth, um, which is great. The other proportion is uh, going to be our press releases. So there are so many different press releases that are published through newspapers and online articles. Um, that we just distilled it with others, but most of that is from uh, the press helping to spread it. Next. So, some of our online posts, uh, social media, Instagram, Facebook, was like this. I know the text is a little bit small to read, but basically just keeping it easy, having you know, a link to sign up for an assessment, having lots of you know, visual representation. Um, this is actually a photo from the assessment. This is Sean White from Friends of the Winooski River. Um, as I mentioned, it's just a very conversational style, casual visit. Uh, you don't have to study for it. <laughs> it's not like to talk but essentially we come to your property, we look at different um, sites around the property, and then we just make these best management practices on um, things that you could do to reduce the impact within your watershed in terms of stormwater runoff, so nitrogen, phosphorus, chloride, 
you know, accumulating and then moving through our watershed and um, being deposited into our stream river, making their way downstream into Lake Champlain. Um, so it's a really nice assessment. People usually feel pretty comfortable and not too pressured by it. And as I mentioned, it's conversational. So um, it's really fun about reading the landowner and seeing if a landowner is amenable to a certain practice we're recommending. Maybe we make a PNC and it says, no, way, we're not doing that. It's not something we're interested. We need to look at it, et cetera. You know, then we just re reevaluate and we recommend something else. And uh, it's really about getting to know the landowner and getting a feel for what they're interested in on their property. So, next slide, please. Thank you. So, top quiz um, who knows what's going on in our office? I've sort of hinted at it uh, as you've chatted. Can I have a guess? Who is it? It's only us. Anybody? Stormwater runoff? Rain. Yeah, rain. Exactly. Any other thoughts? Rain and. Okay, go ahead. So, Hannah. Typically, it's a roof or something. What? Yeah, it's mostly on the surface. You've got it coming. Exactly. Yeah. Excellent. So, think of my attempt at making a little bit more interactive. Yeah. Uh, the way it's to be talked. Uh, so, I'm happy to interact with you and engage with you. So, yes, yeah, stormwater runoff is precipitation. We get a lot of different types of precipitation here in Vermont snow, rain, sleet, hail. What am I missing? So, any form of precipitation, urban or suburban. Exactly, it falls, it's not evaporating, and um, it's not soaking into groundwater due to, you know, it could be torrential rain, it could be that the soil is heavily compacted. There's a couple of different um, components that play into that, but it's instead running over the land and taking up phosphorus, nitrogen, chloride, and road salt, cigarette butts, plastic bottles, salt poop, you name it, it's taking up whatever. Yeah, it's up to in the water, so it's the minutes um, acting as a conduit for those nutrients to be flowing into our streams, into our rivers, and eventually into the ground. So, um, so we're concerned with stormwater. Next slide, please. And this is our attempt at, um, as a watershed conservation organization, at minimizing the amount of stormwater runoff that we're experiencing. Educating landowners on how they can have an impact, etc. Are there any questions so far on any of that? Yes, the place. That's a question. I wonder of the dominant runoff materials. Yeah, so there's a lot of uh, talk around phosphorus, um, particularly with the Department of Environmental Conservation, all of our tactical basin planning. Um, there's a lot of strategizing around phosphorus production, including a phosphorus production tool that we can plug all of our larger projects into, like culvert repl replacement, um, riparian and buffer plantings, smaller projects, and we'll actually uh, identify the kilograms of phosphorus that are removed. Um, with that project, and it helps us to prioritize, you know, what actions we're taking on. Um, nitrogen is also a very important issue. Phosphorus is sort of the biggie that folks are focusing on. But uh, chloride and nitrogen, they're also. Uh, that is a multi tiered question. So, phosphorus is naturally occurring in soil. Uh, as you have a stream eroding that's transporting sediment, which has phosphorus in it downstream, um, agricultural sectors, a lot of it is from stormwater runoff. So we'd really like to address that within our mission, which is sort of the energy behind the storm smart program. But again, it's not in the water. It's coming from us. Uh, 
soil. It's not going to violate the soil. So there are a few different best management practices, BMPs, that we recommend. Uh, the list, I will not read it exhaustively because we all can read, but I will give you a few of these and just, um, you know, to know why we're recommending them, how they uh, impact the home and the collection of stormwater and how to soak, uh, excuse me, how to sink in slow down and spread out stormwater. That's sort of the main objective. Our shadows of our partners uh, like to say we have five to five per property. So I think that's a good way to think about it. Essentially, uh, is precipitation is falling on your residential parcels. We are encouraging landowners to keep the stormwater on site opposed to running off where it will continue to uh, accumulate these nutrients and Deposit them into our waterways and then So, um, throughout our partnership, we have made a lot of best management practice recommendations. So, 407 uh, throughout the Storm Smart 1.0 program. Um, we received another three year grant 2022 to 2025. This covered 2019 to 2022. Um, so they're all a few years apart. So we made a lot of recommendations for the past few years with our partnership. And again, you can see them here. I won't rather them off to you, but um, lots of rain barrels, lots of low mow zones. That's sort of one of the easiest things that you can do. Just like three years ago. <laughs> Where they're a little bit easier. The nutrient communication program has a reasonable really initiative, so even if you're letting your grass grow to three inches long, a relatively short root system, um, it does buffer some stormwater and slows it down so that it can be very awesome. Um, there's other projects in here like rain gardens, infiltration fences, permeable pavers that require a bit more um, expertise, but we have tons of resources and guides and um, we try to break down those barriers for homeowners. Again, as I mentioned, this is a really handy guide to get passed around after we've talked, just so I can keep your attention. Um, but it has a lot of really great resources on how to put in a dry well, the time that involves, the cost that involves. It gives you essentially step by step guide on how to do it. Uh, really great publishment from the C Grant um, DEC, or excuse me, the Agency of Natural Resources. And it's being monitored. So, um, great resource. I pass these out to all of our uh, property owners and everyone can help you with that. I think it's just important if you're making these recommendations for really not just tell them how to, or what to do, but how to do. Do you have a question? Um, a couple of years ago, I was helping my cousin with his um, cabinet and comes in, but okay. he said I was great water catching. Barrels, but you made sure to put them on the hidden side of the building side because he told me that the township is not allowed rainwater collection in the state of New York. not allowed rainwater collection. The building construction, I wonder if you've ever heard of something. I have, uh, in my graduate studies, taken um, water policy and law classes. And I know there's a difference between Eastern riparian right and Western water law. And I see that type of scenario happening more so uh, out West due to water appropriation, first in land, first in right type of thing. But I'm not familiar with that uh, in New York. So I can't speak to New York specifically, but I know that in Vermont, uh, they could to use technification. Um, Sisters and Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, can you start infiltration trenches or trails? Absolutely. It can be done. I'm going to touch on each of these directly. This is interesting content for um, you all to be learning about as you're meeting with landowners and not only you know, the building design aspect, but if you're focusing on landscape. Landscaping architecture, these can be really great 
uh, assets to be incorporated into your work. So let's talk about reason. Thank you for coming. That was great. <laughs> that was great. Thank you. So exactly, green browns, you know, you can see there's a small metric here in terms of um, rainfall. We've had a lot of rainfall this summer historically. I've been in contact with a lot of people who are saying, where can I get another rain barrel? Mine are completely full and I watered my tomato plants and I still need another one. So um, working on providing those to the community, uh, but you can forward a lot of water uh, depending on the amount of precipitation that's falling. And essentially a rain barrel is just an easy um, uh, best management practice to install in terms of installation. All you have to do is take your downspout, cut it, and redirect it. They sell these little downspout snakes at hardware stores, um, and just direct the water into a barrel. You can use it to water your gardens, water your vegetable gardens, your flower gardens, uh, wash your car. It's not recommended to drink because uh, it's not been filtered, obviously, but um, Essentially, I mean, I use mine. So, um, we do have lots of resources on how to build a rain garden on our website, on the WNRCG website. Happy to pass that along to Sarah, who can then facilitate um, passing that around to the rest of you. But rain barrels are really uh, great resources in terms of just storing water on site. You know, water is hitting your roof and then running off. Um, it's probably not collecting too many nutrients off of your roof, but it's the once it hits the ground and continues seeds that uh, can have detrimental impacts. So trying to reduce the amount of water that's going in there. Next slide, please. Sure. Right. Sure. Say that again. What area? Volume. Uh, You've got one inch to raise that rain barrel. So that depends on what area. You need. So half an inch of rain can fill 280, uh, 280 gallons. Are you saying that? Uh, square feet area. Of, how many square feet of whatever? Well, that to you. <laughs> I have not sure. I'm not, I don't have the number of figures on it. I am happy to. Yeah, connect with you uh, in and out about that. So, you can connect with us. So, uh, let me mention the four little mode zones, and also another really great support um, in terms of best management practices that we recommend. Raising the blade branches can do a lot of good. Also, just replacing your lawn with um, more. Biodiverse species can be really beneficial. Uh, longer root systems, more robust root systems will be having a greater water holding capacity than I think Kentucky bluegrass is like a pretty common grass species that's used. Very short root systems, really not pulling down a lot of water, just moving across the watershed. Um, so I always encourage people, the best thing that you can do is to just incorporate a low mode zone into your property. Welcome, giving a quick presentation on best management practices that we recommend to our uh, Storm Smart program. So, next question. And also lawn aeration. So, it's as simple as taking a pitchfork and stubbing it around your lawn. It just breaks up the soil aggregates within your lawn, especially if you have an area that is becoming very compacted. Due to foot traffic or your lawnmower going over it, um, taking a pitchfork and just aerating your soil can allow for more precipitation to infiltrate, percolate down into um, deeper into the soil and then into the groundwater. They also make these things that you can rent at like Lowe's or Home Depot. It's basically like a push behind and it's like a spinning wheel, sort of looks like a medieval torture mechanism, but pitchfork works just as good. <laughs> And you probably are probably with that. So I always encourage folks that are dealing with soil compaction issues to pull out that open for and so push. Next slide, please. 
plant made of perennial. Uh, here in the east coast, aesthetic of your lawn, it's going to create wildlife habitat, pollinator habitat. It's also going to slow down the water runoff because it's moving across the property. Again, more robust root system. Really, uh, I think it's highly tailored to the site. I uh, have a good handle on native plants and um, species preference, the shade color, the full sun. Um, depending on if you have a wetland, you know, hydric plants, uh, there's a lot of different parameters that go into it. I have a long, long list that I always provide to landowners in terms of aesthetic and also site selection um, in terms of what perennial you grow best. But plant, planting perennials are a wonderful way to uh, slow down. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Awesome. I would love to see this. <laughs> so I my next task at the University of the Research Conservation District in addition to running the Star so Smart program. I also organized the annual tree sale. Um last year's theme was fruit and nut trees. So that was really fun. Um we're working on connecting with our local nurseries and placing orders for this year. And depending on what they have available, we'll sort of sift out our theme, but um, we really focus on local nurseries, which is really great trying to keep local nurseries in business. Uh, the stock is usually much more adapted to Vermont and um, just to go with it. Okay. Next slide, please. Okay, rain garden. So I know that Holly Green uh, presented on rain garden construction in Montana. Uh, focus too, too much or reiterate what she had to say, but uh, rain gardens are also another fantastic way to slow down, stay in, and spread out stormwater moving across the property. So essentially, um, it's a dome shaped uh, structure, a hole in the ground, <laughs> and it's filled with um, stone, geotextile material, stone material. And then planted with plants that can withstand um, seasonal inundation. So we're not planting hydric plants per se, but plants that have that can deal with temporarily wet feet. Um, also, I really encourage folks as they're considering plant selection to think about salinity tolerance. If you are in an area that um, is getting a lot of salt spread on a road and then that's running off onto your property and you want to plant a rain garden. Um, there are certain species that are more tolerant to salinity, salt concentration. So just thinking about, you know, adaptability and the success of a best management practice if you're putting, if you're taking the time, effort, and funds to implement it. Um, what key areas can we focus on for success? So in addition to being really aesthetically pleasing, um, rain gardens are also fantastic at slowing down stormwater and allowing it space to infiltrate for continuous to flow of the river. Next slide, please. Infiltration sensors. What was your question? Oh, okay. Swales and infiltration sensors? Yeah. I just wanted to make sure I'm touching on the bigger picture. Okay. Yeah. So, um, so an infiltration sense, it can be, it's sort of been site dependent. So this is really the key point of conducting these site assessments. We could do a desktop analysis, which I do before every site visit, go on to the Agency of Natural Resources Atlas, punch in the address, look at the site, look at the soil, um, Type that they have on NRTS website. Look at if there's perennial trees nearby, if they live in the wetland, et cetera. Um, but it's really impactful when you're visiting the site and then seeing, you know, on the ground what type of best management practice would work best with. So you can have an infiltration sense that's a gravel line soil around the perimeter. Of the house, it acts as a temporary water holding space to pour water 
typically we um, encourage folks to plant or to, not to, my mind's all <laughs> to install an infestation bed around the perimeter of their home or their farm or their garage if they don't have gutters. If you've got gutters, rain barrel is a great option. If you don't have gutters, an infestation bed is a good option in terms of catching those roof drips or cheap flow if it's really pouring. Um, and then storing it so they have more time to treat that. Uh, or there's other type of system for our French green that can be a bit removed from the home and it essentially does the same thing back to uh, similar to a dry well, but you can also take a permeated PVC pipe. PVC pipe, a bunch of holes drilled in it, and it effectively directs the water to a more stable uh, vegetated. Yes, so, good segue into a dry well. There's sort of similar, the infiltration trench uh, typically directs water away to a more vegetated area, whereas a dry well is essentially um, uh, a mountain surface area dug down and filled with fresh stone and then larger rock. And if people are interested in a rain barrel, uh, a dry well can be another way. The MP to recognize. Again, gives the space for water to be held temporarily as it allows for impact. I don't know if it's, um, you know, folks are saying, well, I put a rain barrel in, but I still, it's getting filled up, uh, and I don't want the water running across. You can oftentimes do a dry well and place a rain barrel on top. So there's just these creative solutions that sort of come out of the conversation style. Of Next question. Okay. Uh, permeable pavers. I'm going to be transparent. I'm not an expert in, in permeable pavers. This is one of the main projects that I recommend that um, homeowners get assistance with in terms of implementation. If you put them in yourself and you do it wrong, it's not very <laughs> Sort of like doing time in yourself. Do you know, your homework, make sure you know what you're doing. The shift level. Um, but permeable papers are a great option for DMC to cross. Similar to an infiltration, it's sort of like a combination of a dry well and an infiltration trench. They have those permeable papers that run parallel mostly that are diverting water and it's allowing for infiltration or for storm water to infiltrate down um, into that rough um, holding space before it infiltrates. And, you know, it looks pretty nice, usually, especially if you get some grass growing between them. There's a lot of different types that can be constructed. I know that there is a shortage of, of the, um, of this style, these, like, diamond shoes. There are kits that you can buy at Lowe's that plastic, they sort of snap together. They work, but they don't have a very long length. I encourage folks to think not just by their own years, but maybe our own years from them and uh, think about the return on your action. So, educated stuff. So, um, I think the main difference is the rock structure. It really depends on the uh, property. If there is a roadside soil, or just any soil, there's a low point in the property that has still in it already. Certainly, you can say that now totally okay, but um, typically a vegetated soil is, has a low point in the middle, a relatively low slope, so it's not super steep, it's a gradual dipping down, uh, planting native plants in descending order, so it's a smaller filling. Um, and again, as water is moving through that channel down uh, through the watershed, it is being absorbed and nutrients are being filtered through the plants that are inside. And it and it just yes. Sure. So these kind of regulations there we're seeing how big the soils with the crop in there. Does that just lower the flow? So the rock will also um, 
If you're thinking about water versus ground map panel, uh, think about energy dispersion. The rock is energetic. Um, they're called chest bands that are used also in, in some of the same, um, you know, corridors or roadside flow. Chest bands are also made of rock. And it's just rock that's placed intermittently along the channel, or you can have an entire rock line channel. And the size of the stone that's placed in there, um, the larger stone is going to be dispersing more energy. So it's losing energy, energy moving through the channel. And it's also um, creating larger pore space for the water to infiltrate. The difference between that and riparian buffer is sometimes towns prefer the rock line um, because it's oftentimes less maintenance. You don't need to mow it. And it can, um, I've seen some roadside scales that have a lot of vegetation grown up there to no maintenance, and then it can obstruct that. So I think that's uh, sort of the perspective and logic behind some towns being less amenable to vegetated swales and more amenable to rock line channels. Does that answer the question? Yeah, sure. Happy to talk more about that. Um, so, again, similar to a rain garden, I always encourage folks if they're considering setting a vegetated swale on your property to think about obstruction. Um, would chest dams be helpful to implement in the vegetated swale uh, as well? Like, what is the volume of water that's moving through here? Is it just a spring on snowmelt, or is it a lot of water moving through? Uh, oftentimes, undersides of perch culverts are also um, a component with this, but that is a little bit more uh, in depth that we're going to do. But we do have some uh, culvert replacement questions. Feel free to ask me about that because that's another project that I work on uh, intimately at the company in terms of quantity. So, riparian buffer planting. These are a couple of photos from last year's riparian buffer planting that we conducted. Um, this is our agriculture specialist, Kathleen Lewis, in the middle. Great resource in terms of all things agriculture conservation district. We partnered with the UD and Forestry class and planted um, riparian buffer in Westbury. We do them annually through a program called Trees for Trees. So in addition to conducting our storm site, storm star assessment, we also, you know, sort of keep an eyeball out for good uh, riparian buffer planting projects. If it's on a larger parcel of land, we can make sure to always loop in the state river scientist, safety Pomeroy to see if it's an appropriate site. Uh, typically we aim for 30 to 50 foot buffers. Um, on average, uh, it's wonderful for wildlife habitat. It's also wonderful for slowing down stormwater, um, creating habitat for fish. If it's really shading the stream, it's creating more of a thermal quality for aquatic organisms. What else? Um, yeah, cherry buffers, they're just, they're excellent. I'm a big fan. <laughs> so. That's probably one of the most impactful things we can do in our watershed. Um, it's not often that we get, you know, landowners that have acres and acres and acres and that have streams flowing through to use riparian buffer, but uh, there have been a few that have come out of the Storm Smart partnership. And, you know, it's just one way that we can help link in with landowners that are amenable and have a great impact on our Oh, I might mention um, in terms of right training buffers, also plant selection peat, alders, willows, um, silky dogwood, tamarack, wood pine. There's a list of species that are they grow really well in right training buffer planting. Uh, again, you see that intermittently uh, with soil, but you can't just plant it and expect it to grow. So I'm sure to always uh, connect with the. Um, you have to 
fish and wildlife specialist, Katie Kane, on you know, what species are going to thrive well in that particular area based on typically based on what's growing on site already and how it's doing, um, if it's established well or suffering, and that can really be a good inference into what we decide to select in terms of species for our team. Okay. Um, so dragons are oftentimes pretty significant contributors of phosphorus and nutrients, um, including nitrogen and phosphorus and chloride. So we encourage um, individuals that have really, really long driveways to put in water bars, which I saw didn't have one in their driveway when it's coming in, A plus. Uh, basically, water bars just divert the water that's going to be coming down the roadway or the driveway into a more stable buffered area where the stormwater can stay there. Um, Breaking driveway is also really important for county. Um, people do with their tractor. I've heard of a couple other creative ways to recount the driveway. Essentially, with a high point in the middle or the high point on one side, and essentially the water is wicking away to the sides, um, you're going to have vegetation on either side to be absorbing it. If it's dipping down to the this way, have vegetation on the side, if it's dipping down the other way, vegetation on the back. Um, there's not a lot of great resources in terms of um, driveway maintenance. The friends of the Mad River put out a document in Better Back Road that's really helpful for landowners. Um, but a lot of times it comes down to the property owner to absorb the cost for the upkeep and in um, it's I'm interested in seeing more uh, funding available for this, but at the time being obviously transparent, a lot of the time it comes down to resources to keep up in on their job. And there's been some instances where um, it's a community on a road, and then multiple people from the community all get storm smart assessments, and then they all contribute to the maintenance. So, there's no unique situations, but um, maintaining the roadway as it is. Typically, uh, water takes the path of least resistance a lot of the time, right down the back line. When you start to see the real erosion that's always forming, that's when you say, might need to recount it, uh, looking like it could use a road repair. And then, again, always coupling that planting for Next slide, please. Let me check how we're doing on time. Seven, we have till 7.30. Eight, oh, three, okay. Excellent, lots of time. Okay, so, um, Infiltration stairs, as you see here, are um, all of these best management practices can be done by the proper unit, which is great. I like to encourage folks to have very steep slopes. I do this a lot of times, like in people's backyards or leading down to a lake, to implement infiltration stairs because if you're traveling up and down steep slopes, soil is getting compacted. It's usually where we see a lot of dry off. Um, in terms of erosion and infiltration stairs can, you know, create a sense of ease uh, and also help to provide infrastructure to absorb some of that um, frequent traffic and also to accommodate for storm, even stormwater management. I like to think about infiltration stairs a little bit creatively. Um, if folks are really interested in gardening, in that area as well. Um, I have encouraged landowners to think about infiltration stairs and then implementing raised beds on both sides. Um, you have to get a little creative in terms of uh, structuring them in, in orientation besides the infiltration stairs, but I know that my raised beds are about yay high, and I regret having them that low. If you could put a uh, box garden beside them, you know, on either side of the infiltration stair. I know one landowner, um, I made that recommendation. They 
from a family picture in your <laughs> so it just uh, provides that gardening space, but also an asset for managing stormwater runoff, um, and it can look really easy function. So this is your you know, sort of finding what's aesthetic, what's functional, um, and taking best management practices into account. Do you want to take the next slide? Thank you. Yeah, awesome. So, so turbulence are also another. You know, an area where I've thought creatively about my best management practices. Filter brands typically um, have, so on a steep slope is where I encourage folks to put filter brands because they actually speed bump. <laughs> if you think about water moving down a steep slope, they hit a filter burn, it disperses it just like the check dam, um, slows it down, helps the water um, sink in and spread out. We can do a series of filter burns in a realm that is typically the most impactful. It's similar to terrace, um, a terrace approach. Does anybody know people for terrace? Let me see if you know people for terrace. Yeah, yeah. I'm not a people sector expert, but I do know that it's pretty cool. Essentially, it's using um, the mounted structure, which is similar to a filter burn. Filter burn is made of rock, as you can see, and then it has uh, filter fabric, geotextile fabric, soil, and then plants um, that are planted into it. But with folks that are doing a lot of um, invasive species eradication, so buckthorn particularly, I'd say you have tons of wood on site. You could use this creatively with people culture technique and create filter burn. So essentially it's taking wood, compost, um, Large structural material that would otherwise be composted, mounding it into a linear fashion. And then you can still put geotextile fabric over it, soil, and plants into it. But as those uh, larger, larger structural components, wood, invasive, particularly black soil, if it decomposes, if it's carbon uh, release, it's going to be sensitive to your plant. Um, and if they're the purpose of our green storm infrastructure for snowball. So, culture burns are one of my big strategies. Next question. So, there's some creativity that can, you know, uh, be sifted out of these assessments. And really, it's about having a conversation with a landowner and looking for the materials that are on site, thinking about it in terms of the landowner's budget, what they're amenable to, what their budget consists of, why. Um, so, this is a good segue into where their interests lie. If you go to somebody who may be doing assessment and they are super into wildlife, you know, I always probably take the benefits of water quality from implementing these types of practices and how it couples with wildlife habitat, um, et cetera. So, we got our funding to do the Strong Smart Assessment through the Lake Champlain Basin Program. And we also got smaller grants um, to do similar work through these assessments um, from the Vermont Fish and Wild. And the funds um, from that project went to the, excuse me, the funds from the license plate sale went to fund uh, our grants to do the story smart. So pretty awesome. Um, most of it comes from LCDP, but we're happy to partner with Fish and Wild with um, Next up, make team. So I think this is in part where the Estimaro community comes in. All of this, that's been discussed by mentioned, do not have a loop forever. Right? So, um, you know, with filter, there might be some maintenance that's involved in the future with rain gardens. Certainly, I just did a rain garden revitalization project. Um, Wearing another hat, so you can also store a smart city on the basic runoff hat uh, for the district. And essentially, I'm bringing a bunch of volunteers together, um, cleaning out the rain garden, digging out all of the sediment. Yes. I know you're giving me the look, I don't want to do that. <laughs> These two amazing volunteers, you know, carefully picked out all of the stones and we sort of disposed properly of the sediment that was in the garden. Put the stones back, put the geotextile, the 
to uh, replant to illustrate very functional and unique to park uh, land use parking in UC. Um, so all of these projects have some degree of maintenance involved. I always communicate that to the landowner. Um, I think it's good to be transparent. Also, I really like this guide that I'll pass around when I finish with my presentation because it highlights the maintenance. And I think that's important um, knowing how much maintenance is going to be going into these projects before you implement them. Um, I would wait to have somebody implement some big green sort of infrastructure project and then just not have the time to fund people. So I think that's an important piece of the puzzle when you're thinking about recommendation. Um, I know there's a lot of towns that, you know, implement green start infrastructure in some way or another, and oftentimes the maintenance is factored in in terms of uh, the project life expectancy and the funds. So when we're doing projects, we oftentimes I encourage folks to think about that. If you're going to be implementing this, also think about if you might have to spend money in the future or time to keep the system. That's a good question. For the contingent plans and not something that I have worked on specifically. So there's water retention plans and water detention plans, and they act similarly. Essentially, uh, it, it happens a lot with big parking lots. The uh, University of Vermont Mall is where I know that there's a lot of um, these ponds. Essentially, it's you know, impervious surface that runs off and is stored in ponds where it is then. Um, uh, filtered before it continues through the watershed. I haven't worked with, um, you know, a town specifically on implementing them, but I have done cleanup projects and public awareness projects around them, mostly um, uh, closer to the lake itself. I wear, I wear another hat called the Recreate Journal Stream Team Coordinator, and essentially we do water quality monitoring and building gardens and uh, encourage folks to adopt these storm drains, et cetera, for um, a next four communities along Lake Champlain, so from Milton down to Shelburne. And um, I've seen, you know, infrastructure in terms of water detention ponds in that capacity, uh, but it's not something that I've recommended to an individual just because it's more um, a town or a municipality capacity to take one of those prior projects on. And if I'm not mistaken, typically they're included in their um, stormwater master plan for the county. So I know that the conservation district has helped towns to generate stormwater master plans in the past. Um, the most recent one that we did was Thunderhill, but I haven't uh, worked directly on this. Um, um, the land owners get the jobs. Mm -hmm. They are permitted to put in a coaching center for long drive of the coaching center. But um, they, they require the funneling plants, the culverts to do uh, retention plants. They're smaller, yeah. you know, plus they have two lots for emergency treatment. So um, everything, I mean, the town needs to be pretty aggressive about the stormwater. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of permitting, um, just the, well, look at the maintenance of it. Yikes. Well, I mean, that's a lot of data. I think it's been there for a while. And this is just one land? It's one land. About 32 of mm these. -hmm. Um, so, um, yeah, so something to think about. You know, what's it going to cost? What's the life loss? It's going to also the maintenance key decision. Um, DEC says, permitting for different projects, especially if folks have a property um, that's in a wetland. Mm -hmm. I always encourage, I take it upon myself to uh, make people aware of what watershed they live in, um, what sub-watershed they live in to bring it down to even more granular level. And if their property is near a wetland, they may potentially need any permitting um, from the east. 
at the person. I am not a therapist. <laughs> so, I can't say what project can you determine. It really depends on uh, the site. Um, but yeah, it's definitely something that should be considered. And um, it's very interesting. I'm wondering if the permitting requires the detention fund. I can see that. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, because it's such a large, uh, it's such a large, large Okay. Yeah. And it's the pinch of Um, 
business at um, condominiums. It really uh, it does the line between the and who now is in to make changes and the type of um, like multi unit housing that's available. If it's a smaller apartment building where one person lives in and they are interested in the level to implement some of the best and practices, um, you know, that's really a sweet spot. If it's a larger condominium building and there are part of the HOA, um, that might be a little bit more restrictive. But yeah, I conducted a home site assessment um, for a uh, condo in Montpelier. There's a four limit. Good question. So yeah, I'm not done that. Yeah. It depends on the drainage area. So the drainage area that's funneling into that rain garden. Terms of like the phosphor or the nutrients that are being filtered. Um, I don't give it not on here, but there is um, the phosphor production calculator through the DHC website. You can pretty user friendly actually. And for many years, you type in like the, um, the drainage area, the size of the structure. There's a few other parameters broken out. Uh, by the type of project that you're doing, and then that will tell you the reduction, the nutrient. I'm just going to get um, in there a little bit. Like, this seems more of a really skewed, like a really sort of oriented, but I, uh, a couple years ago there was a thing in Burlington about uh, uh, the pilot that had actually paid people to install some of the Um, is that blue? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, I didn't know there was eight people. I, I can think of something like that, but I thought that there was like five bucks a square foot. So I thought it was just a number. Oh, yeah. But it struck me that they could have to look at it. It's not a good thing. Right. Um, That's not something that we have incorporated into the structure of this yeah. program. Um, I could. Yeah. Not something that we have built in just because each some site is uh so dangerous. But that's a really good question. And I will have to look into uh blue and pay people and how they sort of built that in because again I see this program continuously evolving. Um so that'd be something that you know, think about the thing. Yeah. Anybody else any questions? You got me for another 30 minutes. Can you do this? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for bringing that up. Great. What's the takeaway? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm going to something. I'll pass these around. You can oh. take them. Um, so I also. Um, provide a map in different areas. So I'm going to take a flip through and then pass it along to your neighbor. So, um, yes, I forgot to mention this at the beginning. Thanks for bringing it up. I provide them with an in depth uh, PDF that's catered specifically to their property. Um, it gives the front page, gives a brief overview of our site visit. Um, I go in depth on the soil types they have, what watershed they're in, what flood watershed, etc. Um, you know, the next, the following pages sort of break down site maps. So the impact map, which shows the areas where there's erosion or soil compaction, or you know, anything that is really of concern um, to us as technical assistance providers. And then the next page, the opportunity map. And uh, it's just an aerial image of your property, and it really lays out, put a rain barrel here, infiltration trench here. This would be a great spot for a vegetated swale. A rain garden would be really well suited over in this area. So just acts as um, 
I think sometimes it can be a lot. Usually these assessments last an hour, and if you're not an expert in doing some mentor assessments, this can be a lot to an expert, right? So we want to provide folks with something to help jog their memory, um, and then the following pages go into detail. A lot of it's pulled from the Baystar Mentor Structure Guide. Um, I also ask one of the alums for each homeowner that I've conducted before. Um, and it details the specifics of their property, um, why each best management practice would be well suited on their particular piece of land, et cetera. And then I was, I'm a big fan of just like passing along all of the resources. If folks read them, great. If they don't read them, that's okay too. I feel like I bring my diligence. So I passed along green garden manuals, uh, made a fruit species list. Anything that's really tailored, the better back road came off the sort of need to address their road maintenance or not need to, but I said I could show the people, but they could do this. Um, and I typically keep it very positive. You know, you're doing a really great job in this area. I would love to see some improvements over here. And um, this is a bit of just my personal ethic, but changing. People into doing something doesn't work. So if you're commending them for you're being such a great one, but do your advice, contact them. Like, Thank you so much for having me out. I would love it if you put a rain garden in the street. It's just much more effective to do that work. The compliment of damage. Yeah, big fan of compliment of damage. Safety, honesty. Hey, I was like, what is your best? For uh, like low light chiropractor. Oh, okay. Um, let me think. I just learned about a new one. It's Dusty Springfield is popping into my mind. It's something. It's like um. Let me get back to you on what that one, what that species is. But there's a bunch there. You know, could be you're keeping this is a really nice one. Um, flocks, so it's creeping flocks. It really depends on the area. Always native. Um, I know that there's some ground cover that is non native that's really established themselves, and people say, Look at this, it's great. And I say, Oh, that's actually thick of sweet invasive. Let's tap them together. So, um, you know, yeah, creeping flocks is a favorite of mine. Um, there is, I'll provide, um, uh, I'll get you a guide. There's a list of the terms of um, maintaining like the dust layer or the soil um, with like leaf litter on people's property, multiple tiers of uh, vegetation. And the guide that I have for rain gardens actually breaks it down by tier so that you can sort of really design this like, beautiful aesthetic leaf haven uh, landscape. With native species. Yeah. It's going to pop into my brain. Short. Let me get back to you. Um, yeah. Any other questions? Okay. Do you get any little purpose? No, because they're actually not part of their rural property. I've done a lot in Montpelier and Burlington, um, in Misty and Essex. I would say a majority of properties that I've done are on smaller um, city charging. And I think a lot of that is social distribution. Um, you know, we see that our neighbor has green gardens and they're doing other things for water quality over here and problems with ours. So we're giving you a call. And we really sort of have that full effect through the social um, diffusion. And there's also a lot of crossover between multiple different programs. We have um, still on. So, lots of programs in Burlington and lots of programs in It's not restricted to, you know, urban, um, urban areas. But we've also conducted properties on larger parcels in our urban areas. And um, sometimes that's where more impactful projects can be fixed out for us. I did a um, site assessment. Um, in the federal way that you can see, and um, I'm getting it at the past, it's past, 
of the North Branch Nature Center. Yes, Worcester, thank you. Um, and that was, you know, a project where I moved in multiple different agency partners to sort of tackle how to recommend best practices. Um, there's a very large film that needed multiple bridges. So, um, yeah, so it's not a smaller parcel, but can be much larger parcel. Well, it's Yeah. It, it crosses the campus. Yes, lots of lots of small, you know, uh, small properties in the city, and also larger farms that contact us as well. We see a nice uh, diversity in terms of parcel size. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So are you having your uh I just want to make sure that I'm understanding you. So just so someone comes and just like plows your driveway and where your snow pile is. No, it's just not that. Not that. Not that. Not that. Not that. Great. 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 Just buckle. Just provide a new one. Great. Great. Um, as well as, as principal new chief 
River website and also some of the values. So happy to pass on any resources that I can. Um, and follow up via email or phone call. Um, if anybody has any you know, later on that day, any stuff in the Great. Thank you. Thanks for all the questions.